warehouses. They're everywhere. All Costco and Ikea warehouses start with a default cube. Some like to delete it. I say use it. You do you. Our cube is going to become our size template. We won't worry about real world scale just yet. We just want some value that's going to make this whole thing easier on us. So we make this cube two meters wide, one deep, and one tall. There. Let's call it template and sit it under the ground so it's out of the way. Let's start making the shelves. The main supports are angle iron. What's that you say? It doesn't matter. Circle back to the comments in about a week and some Simpsons comic book store guy will have explained it to everyone. I made a cube, shrank it down, and deleted all but two faces. Now, I sized it up to the template box so that it will fit all nice and tidy-like. I also added a solidify modifier to this so it has some thickness. Angle iron has holes, so let's make some. I used a bunch of cylinders, arrayed them, and moved them into position. Then added a boolean modifier to the iron piece, selected the cylinders, and there, I made lots of holes. <laughs> I, I said cylinders. Looking at this, I decided to bevel one of the corners to give it some roundness. I know what I need to do after too many years of making money doing this, so that's it. That's probably all I'll need for this. If I need more, I'll do more later. Now that I have what I want, well, no, I, I need to shrink the holes. I adjusted the cylinders, and there, now it's scaled just a bit better. The magic of making this in a procedural manner, using modifiers and later geometry nodes, is that if something sucks later, we can fix it pretty easily. Or at least, you know, we don't have to recreate things, like with this Boolean thing. Okay, now I just have to move this guy over to one of the corners, center the pivot to the 3D cursor, which is important for this, and then add a mirror modifier. Choose the axis you want. Then you can hit Ctrl D to duplicate the modifier and choose a different axis. Now you have four supports. They may get the same textures later, but with this it's not going to be really noticeable, probably. And, and if it is, like we'll have the flexibility to address that later on as well. Onward and downward. Oops, the, the holes didn't come in. Here's the power of proceduralism. All I have to do is move the cylinders over and ooh, all four now have holes again. It's magic, baby. Yeah. Oh, it makes more sense for the angle iron to have one more side too. If I go back to the original and extrude one more edge, there, now they all have more sides. Now, for the cross beams, or whatever they're called, seriously, like the comments section, two weeks tops, I just used a plane, subdivided it, stretched it out, extruded it, and made sure it made sense. I could bore you with all the modeling here, but it, there are like 20 new Blender videos uploaded every minute now. Like, I used the edge loop and extrude tools here. This video up here I, I made like four years ago explains it pretty well if you need that, and that's totally cool. Now that I had the two I needed, I duplicated one and used them to make the other sides, just moving points around. Just like I did on the beams, I made support beams inside using the same technique, except on cubes because they're thicker. I made one, moved it into position, and did an array modifier for the rest. Simple and done. After that, I colored them because they were looking boring, and because I wanted to shade them later. And then I just finish them off by adding some more support bars. Once I finish these things, I usually add them to a new collection. In this case, I made a new collection called Shelves and moved in all the parts that make these up. This will be important later, and it keeps things in our scene organized. Now I needed wood pallets. You know the things that you ram with your carts every time you go to Costco? <laughs> Those. And they splinter too, which is really fun to pick out of your paper towels when you get home. These are just cubes stretched, duplicated, and positioned. Like, that's it. Like, they're really simple shapes, and you don't need much detail to be convincing, especially because they're going to be under tons of boxes. I'll show you how to make them look more real later. Now it's time to make things that go on the shelves. For this, I'll just use boxes, but you can go crazy and put whatever you want in there on the shelves. Like, just make sure you do it in a way that I'll get into later, and it's going to be awesome for you. A box is a cube, if you... <laughs> If you can believe that. I'm pretty sure there's a small group of people now that refute that, but that's so 2025. I just, I just called it. For the box, I just made a new cube, then found a picture of boxes on a royalty-free photo site and made sure I could use it commercially. I, I like to do that. I, I know, I know, I'm, I'm a Luddite for not stealing. I mean, using what's out there and hustling to get mine. I mean, just, just kidding. Let's, let's move on. I loaded this image into the UV editor in Blender, then just remap it to break it up. Then select the faces that I want and move them into position over the parts of the image that I want them to texture. This is quick and dirty. You could spend more time here if you want. I didn't, but, you know, it'll probably look better later if I do. I made like four boxes of different shapes and then threw them all into the new collection called Boxes. Notice that I created a new collection called Palette for Palette as well. I, I didn't mention that before. Now I did the same technique with the palette using a wood texture. 
If you do this well, it'll look pretty convincing depending on how far the camera is from the object. Obviously, if you get really close, you'll need way more detail and probably some displacement. But for this, we'll see if it's fine. I also made three across to fit the shelf width. Now the bottoms needed feet so they don't scratch the floor or you know, have more support or something. I just made a cube, positioned it where I wanted it, and then mirrored it twice to get the feet. If you're still here, awesome. Here's where we make lots of structures with lots of boxes. For this, I usually use a single vertex and call it Geonodes. I made it all caps here so it's easy to see in the outliner. You don't have to do that. The single vertex thing just makes it easier for me, but it could really be any object you choose. I select it in the outliner, which is easy now because it's in all caps, and then I go to Geometry Nodes tab and hit New. This makes a new chain. We can delete the node on the left, then add in a mesh line using Shift A, going to search and typing mesh line, then hook that up to the node on the right. You'll now see a line in the viewport. This is what we're going to use to instance our shelves onto. Drag in the whole shelves collection. Then add in an instance on points node, hook the collection up to the instances node on the instance on points node, and you'll see a stack, like magic. The reason this works right off the bat is that the mesh line has an offset of 1 meter on the z-axis. Our shelves have a height of 1 meter. That means that they neatly fit between the points on the mesh line. Get it? If not, this whole scene is going to be up on my Patreon linked below. If we play with the count on the mesh line now, we get more shelves. Awesome. Simple stuff, but we can build on it. I'll be keeping this simple though, as we can get pretty effective with simplicity. Let's select these nodes, excluding the last one, and hit Control G to make it a group. Let's also hook the count up to the group input node. I'll address this in a minute. Now, to make the shells be able to propagate in a row or an aisle, we can duplicate the mesh line and the instance points on the node. Position them around the ones we copied, hook up the second inputs to point node to the group output, hook the first instance on points output to the instances input on the second one, hook the count to the group input for later, then change the offset from one on the Z to two on the X. Since our shelf is two meters wide, this works. In changing the offset from Z to X, we also made the line horizontal. Now we are instancing our stack of shelves onto our new line. For housekeeping, we can also hit N and change the names of count inputs to rows and height to make for a cleaner interface once we jump up a level. See, now we have a nice and tidy group with decent label names in the main geometry nodes window. I know I'll be using mesh line and instance on points pretty often, so I create nodes here and move them off to the side. With a nice tidy group node, I can now instance the palettes. I could do this inside the shelf group, but I'll keep them separate here. It's, this is just a choice, just a personal choice here, nothing more. The palettes are pretty much the same setup as the shelves. I added in a join geometry node here so I could see the output of everything in the viewport. Then, work setting up the same system here. You could just duplicate the group you made before, and be sure to hook up the collection to the group input if you choose to go that way so that you can pipe in different collections from the outside or from an internal list. Once you test this and see if it works, you can group this as well and move on. Let's populate the shelves with our boxes. For these, I could do this with geometry nodes, but it became really ridiculously complex for no, no real reason. I chose instead to make a collection for each stack of boxes, then inside each collection I'd instanced a bunch of boxes and offset them. That way, I could make endless collections and variety and bring them into the geometry node setup and have near endless variety without too much setup. Using the same setup as before, I'm using setup a lot. I added in a new join geometry node, then used geometry to instances plugged into the new instance on points node, then dropped in the four box collections and hooked them up to the geometry to instances. I turned on pick instances on the first instance node and got a pattern repeating up. I surrounded those with another mesh line and instance node like before and got them to stack and propagate down the aisle too. Adjust the offset until they look right, and again, it's, this is all up on Patreon if you want. Now they work, but they look very congruent. We need to break them up and make them way more random. One less complicated way is to add in a random value set to integer into the instance index on the instance to points node. Then add in an ID field node to the ID on the random value node. Check pick instance and play with the max number. It starts to change, but not quite what we want. A quick fix here was to group that whole new box setup and plug in the seed value to the group input. Then plug a few of these groups into a new geometry to instance node and change that seed value on each group. It was looking better. Now wrap the whole thing in a new mesh line to instance on points chain, and you can instance out entire sets of aisles. You can even create instances of your whole aisle setups and make even more aisles with very light memory load. Add in some shaders and make the metal more metal. I'd use some PBR materials here. 
Add in a roof and some scaffolding that you can easily repeat. This didn't have to be great details, it's so far from the camera, but you can get crazy. I mean, get crazy. Like, add pipes and vents and ducts and mylar balloons and whatever. I lit this with a series of instance planes to emit light from the ceiling down. I made them large so as not to get too noisy in the image. I'd added some nuts and bolts in the assembly just to give it some small detail, and then added in cards for the labels on the shelves. To push it, I'd add textures and labels, but I didn't hear because I still have PTSD from pronouncing any product at Ikea. Lastly, I'd added in some randomness to the boxes in their respective collections to make it a bit more interesting. There, a few hours of planning and it's something to work with. You can push this pretty far and Cycles will render it. The trick is to use instancing wherever you can, and to do your best to break up anything that's too similar or repetitive. Shots like this can always use more detail, but the technique can yield massive results that you can tweak. It's all just moderately complex scattering effect. For more of this type of thing, especially exteriors, these two videos go into a lot more details. They really break down some of the more granular use cases, and you can get pretty far with minimal modeling work to fill out a scene. Keep in mind, though, that anything really close to the camera always needs more attention. Thanks for watching, and have a great whatever.